Karen Kittredge. I'm a professor of English at Ithaca College and I've been teaching here for 22 years. The story of, of my working with Melusina Trunch goes back now 12 years. I was just turning 40 and I had tenure, my kids were getting older, everything was good. But I felt like I'd sort of gotten into a rut. I, I needed something that I could call my own, like some element of the 18th century that I could really dig into and make into a project. And I have to admit, I think I was having a kind of a midlife crisis. And then there I was. And it was time for something new. And I couldn't really figure out what that was going to be. So I talked to my sister. Uh, so I'm Susanna Ottaway. I teach early modern European history at Carleton College, and I'm a British historian. And Catherine Kittredge is my oldest sister. That summer, the summer of 2002, the two of us took off for England. Um, when Catherine had just kind of finished up a lot of the research that she had been doing on spinsters, um, she was really looking for another project, and she was kind of adrift and not sure what she wanted to do next. Um, and I was, as I said, just finishing up a project, and so I was in the opposite state. I was kind of tying up loose ends and checking things out. And so um, we decided we'd go together to London. And we, we went all over. We went up to Scotland, we went to little tiny towns outside of London, we went to the south of the country, we did the British Library, and it was great in so many ways. Um, during that time, um, she, I think she emailed me or called me just incredibly excited about finding this one diary of this incredibly cool woman that she'd never heard of before. And, and it was the next to last day that I was in England, it was a Saturday, and a series of things had sort of happened. You know, there had been a tube strike, so I couldn't go to the British Library, and I thought I would go back to Chelmsford and do some transcription, but my borrowed computer had died. And I was just I was frustrated, and I didn't want to waste the last day, so I thought, you know, my, my grandmother loved Jane Austen and Winchester is an easy train ride from London. So I know that there's an Austin Lee archive, the Hampshire Record Office. I'll, I'll just indulge myself and go for a day to Winchester. And so I took the train and went to the record office. So I pulled down the big paper record of their holdings, which was this enormous kind of folio book. And I started paging through the Austin Lee collection, and there was this name that came up over and over again. Melusina Chenevie St. George Trench. It was like a name out of Lemony Snicket. Uh, you could see her just getting more and more involved in this person's life, and um, really quickly. I mean, within the first couple of days that she discovered Melusina, she got really excited about learning more about her and about trying to understand her. And so I just, I started filling out little slips of paper and putting them in and the archivist would say, um, document for Kittredge, and I'd trot up and get whatever it was. And I just kept doing it and she was fascinating. She um, wrote about every topic under the sun and they'd saved crazy personal scraps of information. She would start writing a poem and it would be on the bottom of a laundry list and the laundry list was there preserved as an official record. So I, I was just having a great time and she was, she's got a very self-deprecating sense of humor. Like she talks about traveling and forgetting the name of her inn when she's in a new city and trying to describe the sign because she's also in a strange place. You know, and so she, she just cracked me up. So I kept ordering Melusina Trench documents and it was about an hour and a half before closing and they brought me a little brown book and I opened it up and the first line was Frederick Trench expired at quarter before eight o'clock in the evening, June the 7th, 1806, aged two years, eight months and four days. And you know, part of me just kind of took a breath. You know, the first 
page of this document is Melusina trying to capture exactly what this little boy looked like. And she, she is trying to describe the color of his skin and the way that his eyebrows mark. Because you have to think, he died after a nine days illness. You know, she didn't have time to really memorialize him. Certainly there were no photographs, no portraits. All she had was the words that she could get down to hold on to this memory. And I, I turn the page of this book and the entire volume, it's about 60 pages, is devoted to her memories of him and working through her grief at his death. And so she describes his favorite foods and the things he liked to do and cute little things that he would say on the street. But she would also talk about her regrets, um, the things that she should have done when he first became ill, um, the things that she wished she had done differently just as his mother. Um, at one point she says, It is only now that I begin to fear the loss of my Frederick as a companion and to regret every hour I devoted to any other pursuit or society while heaven spared him to me. And I'm, I'm reading this at the end of you know, being away from my own children for the first time for three solid weeks. And you know, it's, I'm, I'm sitting in the record office at this point, and there's sort of tears wandering down my cheeks. And I've been reading in archives for hours and hours for the last three weeks. You know, I'd, I'd show up on the archive steps when they open, and they kick me out when they close. And I've been reading document after document, and I've, I've never seen anything that affected me so profoundly, that really brought the experience of motherhood from that time alive in such a poignant way. So I um, asked them to do a microfilm for me, which is what we did back in those days. Um, and I flew home and decided that what I was going to try to do was bring this document into the 21st century. So I found the remains of the late Mrs. Richard Trench, which was a collection of um, excerpts from her letters and diaries, which her second oldest son had edited right after her death. She was raised by her grandfather, who was the Archbishop of Waterford. So as a tiny little girl, she'd, she'd been orphaned at age four, as a tiny little girl, she lived in the Archbishop's palace. And she ran around there, was the only child. Um, her recreation was reading in his library where he had first folio editions of Shakespeare and various classical works. So I just, I have this image of this tiny little girl, you know, handling these materials that are bigger than she is almost and, and growing up in this great, huge, echoing place. Um, her grandfather died when she was 12, and she then became the ward of her mother's father, who really seemed to have liked cards, he liked sho socializing, drinking, wasn't very interested in, in raising a teenage girl at that point. So she says that she became an independent heiress at the age of 13. And she went from living this very sort of secluded academic life with her grandfather to suddenly being thrown into the world of Dublin society. And she talks about um, getting proposals starting at age 14, usually from men she wasn't really that interested in, but there is a sense of the world kind of sitting up and taking notice of her and her as a teenager just not really knowing what to do with that attention. As I'm looking at these materials, it occurs to me that I know these are excerpts, and so there, and I know that there are thousands and thousands of pages of documents at the Hampshire Record Office. So I begin to wonder if there's material that maybe the son isn't really talking about. So I send off, um, I write to Jane Harris, who's my contact at the Hampshire Record Office, and I find out that there is partial autobiography that Melusina had written. Um, so I send off a microfilm like this, 
And one of the things that's really kind of shocking about this is she writes um, from her time as an infant up until her first marriage at age 19. And the way that she describes her first husband she talks about him as a libertine, as a man about town, as a serial seducer of women. I'm entangled in a clandestine correspondence. I have deviated one step from the right path and have knows when I shall return to it. My first letter appeared necessary, my second convenient, and the most frivolous pretenses gave rise to the rest. Shall my heart forever deceive my judgment? And. I'm reading this and I'm thinking about her as a, a girl who'd grown up in this sheltered environment and you just want to, you know, yell, run, Melusina, run, this is not the guy for you. Um, it was like watching Lizzie Bennet being seduced by Wickham, you know, and he was using all these subterfuges to get access to her and he's using emotional blackmail to make sure that she reads his letters and it, it's just kind of a, a fascinating document because this is a man that she does actually marry and with whom she has her first son Charles who is I think in many ways the focus of her life um, but she may have been fortunate he died uh, four years after their marriage and for the last two years of the four years he was really really sick so he never as far as I know betrayed her <laughs> he never he was sort of too sick to do anything bad so that kind of worked out but the fact that she would in retrospect write about him so candidly and say things that were really I think not the things that one would normally publicize about the father of a beloved child was sort of one of the, the first indications for me that Melusina may have been a lot more complicated than perhaps I had given her credit for. The other thing that, that showed up after I had read The Remains, now, in The Remains, Melusina is very much kind of the, the woman about town, um, going to parties, meeting celebrities. Dined at Mr. Elliot's with only the Nelson party. It is plain that Lord Nelson thinks of nothing but Lady Hamilton, who is totally occupied by the same object. She is bold, forward, coarse, assuming, and vain. Her figure is colossal, but excepting her legs and feet, which are hideous, well-shaped. After dinner, Lady Hamilton, who declared she was passionately fond of champagne, took such a portion of it as astonished me. Lord Nelson was not behindhand, calling more vociferously than usual for songs in his own praise, and after many bumpers proposed the Queen of Naples, adding, she is my queen. She's queen to the backbone. As to Queen Charlotte, she be damned. So originally, Melusina's son publishes just the travel journal, and he say, it says that it's actually not published, but just printed for a few copies for private circulation. However, the Times of London gets hold of one of these copies, and they do a long article about it. The time has fully arrived in this case when these scenes may be claimed as materials for historical portraiture. Had the Dean kept these materials to himself, we conceive that biographers would have reason to complain of their concealment. So on one hand, Nelson is the quintessential British hero. So various periodicals and various individuals weigh in, including George Matcham, who is one of Nelson's descendants, the glory of Britain depends as much on the heroes she has produced as on her wealth, her influence, her possessions. And the true patriot and honorable man will at least refrain from any premeditated act which may dim their fame. And the controversy goes on with periodicals going back and forth about whether or not this piece belongs in public circulation. The character of one of the real heroes of history should be thoroughly known known in its weakness no less than its strength. Um, in addition to her son publishing this collection of works, she also had an extensive correspondence with a Quaker woman in Ireland. And that Quaker woman died shortly before Melusina, and her daughter also edited a collection of excerpts from the correspondence. So I have, on one hand, the son's collection and the daughter and the daughter of her friend's collection. 
The son never mentions the fact that her, his mother became a very serious writer. And it's not until I go to the Leadbetter papers that I find out that she was known as an author and specifically as a poet. So there's a letter from Anna Seward, who's one of the movers and shakers of the Blue Stockings, praising her uh, literary performance. It's awful that just, <laughs> you know, sort of every cliche from late 18th century poetry that exists is, is there. You know, it's, it's, it's overdramatic, the people don't speak in anything resembling normal dialogue, she messes with the meter so it doesn't quite work, you know. And it's fascinating to me because on one hand, I've read material from her that's moved me like nothing else that I've read. And then I have this, this published work, which was supposed to be something that know the people who really knew literature found so admirable and it's it's appalling um, so I'm I'm discussing the kind of juxtaposition of you know an incredibly powerful private writing with this really kind of embarrassing public performance with my friend Chris Monzi who at that time was editing the British Journal for 18th Century Studies and he said, well, why don't you write about that? So that became the first publication about Melusina that had come out in 120 years. Um, and so on one hand, I'm, I'm kind of launched then um, writing about Melusina, but my, my goal is still very narrowly focused at this time. I want to get the morning journal that she wrote about her young son into print. I think it's something that could be used in the classroom. I think it's something that could have real impact on people who are studying kind of the history of the family or mourning or motherhood. And I start contacting publishers and over and over again I find out they can't take a chance on an unknown woman. That a first person account by somebody nobody's ever heard of is something that simply is not going to fly. So I decide that what I'm going to have to do is make Melusina known. So I go off to conferences and I give papers about her and about the Morning Journal. And then I realize that one of the things I really need to find out about is her other published works. So Mary Queen of Scots is abysmal but it's only the first of six volumes that she published. So maybe as she grew older and read more deeply and had more literary friends, her writing will actually improve. So once off, I go off to England and I go back to the record office and start looking at her other journals, seeing if there's something that maybe I can combine with the morning journal to make a, a larger volume and I go to Oxford because the Bodleian Library has everything Melusina has ever published. Now this is where things get sort of interesting because I had a list of the various things that she had published and one of them is called Laura's Dream and it has as a secondary topic the Moonlanders. So I have no idea what this is about. Nobody has ever written about it. It's been completely lost. Um, and I access the copy and I start reading and kind of, I get the kind of little tingling on the back of my, my head because <laughs> you know, one of the things that I do here at Ithaca is I teach a lot of science fiction. And I'm specifically very interested in the intersection of feminism and science fiction. So that brings together kind of two things that I teach. And generally, Mary Shelley's Frankenstein is seen as the beginning of a true woman's text that is recognizable as modern science fiction. And here I am, and I'm reading this poem, and it's been published two years before Mary Shelley wrote Frankenstein, and it is pure sci-fi. 
she is positing this race of people on the moon and she has completely reinvented her alien species. They um, reproduce in a kind of weird asexual way. They have wings, their lifespan is radically different. She talks about the way that they interact with the um, animals and the larger environment of the moon. You know, it's, it's on one hand, um, because it's written in verse, it is kind of funny. On the other hand, it as a work of imagination and as a work more than that of extrapolation, you know, she has footnotes where she talks about various kind of properties of the moon. She, she was really kind of fascinated by astronomy and how she has taken those properties and woven them into her story. You know, this is true science fiction and it's so early and it's so sort of captivating in the, the pure joy in creating stuff that's involved in it um, that I immediately copy as much as I, as I can and start writing about that, which is published in science fiction studies. And science fiction studies also saw fit to publish the entire text of the poem. The, the quest to make Melusina into a household name goes on. Um, I publish about her everywhere I can think of. Um, Tulsa Women's Studies. I write online biographical pieces for her for the Chawton House Library and also for Alexander Street Press's Irish Romantic Women's Poet database. I continue to give talks mostly to empty rooms as it turns out. Finally, I kind of get to a point where I've said everything I can think of to say. I send off my last article, which is about the way that her son had edited her works for publication. And I decide that I just want to go on one last research trip. And at this point, nobody's going to give me funding for this anymore. But the Beinecke Library in New Haven has 30 of the letters that she wrote to her friend Mary Legbader. And I go to the Beinecke Library and I, I put in the order for the 30 letters. And I think, you know, I'll, I'll be here for a couple of days and maybe I'll look at what else they have. There aren't 30 letters, there are over 300 letters. This begins to fill in the gaps in the later part of Melusina's life. Uh, her uh, biography as her son had presented it kind of draws a curtain when she's in her 40s um, and says something along the lines of, um, Melusina continued to write and be very interested in social causes, um, but because of the length of this manuscript, we will pull a veil over those years. But those are the times when Melusina kind of raised her head and looked around and thought, what am I doing with my life? Um, she begins to be a social activist in a way she'd never been before. She becomes very serious about her writing. And a lot of this is hidden because she felt that it wasn't really appropriate for her to publish under her own name. So she had article after article, poems, stories, translations that were being published in periodicals, both in Ireland and in England, and we have no way of tracing them until you go to the letters that she wrote to her friend Mary, and she'll list, this is what I published this week. Meanwhile, my last article that I had written has come out in Afroben Online. It was published in the spring of 2011. About a week after this comes out, I get an email from Australia. Now, I don't know anybody from Australia, so there's part of me that just assumes that it's spam. On the other hand, in the um, subject heading, there's the name Melusina. So I think, well, you know, you, you never know. And I open it up, and it's a letter from a genetics researcher in Queensland named Georgia Trench. And it opens... Dear Catherine, my sister just sent me the link to your article, which I found fascinating. I'm Melusina's great-great-great-granddaughter, and her portrait looks down at me as I write. Because I'm a geneticist, 
I took it upon myself to trace all of his 250 or so alive descendants for the 200th anniversary of her son's birth. That was Richard Chenevick Stretch. Anyway, I'm delighted to see that she hasn't been forgotten outside the family. Apparently, you can buy a book on her book on child rearing for 13 rupees in India. So I must try to get one. Best wishes, Georgia Chenevick Stretch. A few weeks later, I get another email from Lucy Trench. Dear Professor Kittredge, I am the sister of Georgia Chenevix Trench. Just as you have been eavesdropping on our family life, albeit a very long time ago, I have been aware of your work and very much admire what you are doing. My father was Charles Chenevix Trench, the senior male descendant of Archbishop Trench, and I now have most of the family material that he inherited. Do you have any plans for coming to England? I would love to show you what I have, and could also introduce you to other members of the family who are interested in Elisina, and might have future further material. Like you, I believe she is worthy of a biography. You are clearly an excellent person to write this, and I'm sure the family will give you every possible support. With best wishes, Lucy Trench. Out of the blue I go from being done with Melisina to suddenly having this opportunity to really find new material. I show up on Lucy Trench's doorstep in February of 2012 uh, with my little backpack, she had invited me to spend the night, and I go up to her spare room um, and look at the materials that she has, and, and they're gorgeous little portraits and sort of some fascinating um, etchings that had been done of her grandfather. But then on, in addition to that, there are nine journals that I've never seen before. You know, I thought that I had seen every single thing Melissina had ever written, but there are these nine journals, most of them over 100 pages each, that had just been living in this trunk in Lucy Trench's spare bedroom for all of these years. So I wound up actually staying at her house for four days, and in a lot of ways it was, it was an archive researcher's dream, because I would roll out of bed in the morning and go over to the desk and start transcribing. And sometime around mid-morning someone would knock on my door, and then I'd have tea and toast with homemade marmalade. Um, and then I'd go back and transcribe furiously until lunchtime when there would be homemade soup, then transcribe some more until dinner when Lucy would cook these amazing gourmet meals and we'd have wonderful kind of wide-ranging conversations. And then I'd go up and transcribe until I fell asleep again. So the fascinating part of this was not just getting this additional insight into Melissina, but it was also being with her descendant. And it was fascinating to know that this woman who had sort of changed my view of the past and given me a kind of a link in a way that, that all of my other research hadn't, was still kind of very much a force or a, a kind of a part of the identity of her descendants. Um, so Lucy Trent, as it turns out, is also one of these people who um, can organize anything. She has just sort of a gorgeous eye for figuring out how to frame things and how to bring people together. Um, so she organized a meeting of the descendants to happen at the fellows talk that I gave at the Chawton Library at the end of my stay. And we had something like 25 descendants um, from three different generations come and I got to meet them all, and they were just an extraordinary group of people. There were historians, um, there was a vicar, um, people who worked in libraries, people who worked in museums, a child psychologist, just bright, interesting, fascinating people. The, the kind of descendants I think Melissina would have been really proud to own. And they got to sit there while I told them the story about Melissina. And I have to say that my favorite moment was one point I looked up and I said, um, I don't think that Richard Trench mentions this in his edited version of her journals, but you did know about Melissina and the Prince. 
there was kind of a collective gasp. Um, Melusina had had a relationship with Prince Adolphus, one of um, George III's youngest sons, while she had been in Germany. And even though we can't say exactly the nature of her relationship from this distance, there were certain quotes I could show the family that definitely showed an intimacy existed and showed that she was really valued by him. And I think everybody likes to know that a prince thought your great-great-grandmother was something pretty special. At the end of the talk, one of the oldest descendants who had traveled the furthest, she had come from Wales, came up to me and out of her handbag she pulls this old volume that says on it rents and she opens it up and it's the autobiography that Melusina's son Francis had started writing. What's really interesting about this is you know he, he didn't go very far into his life he kind of abandoned the, the process fairly early on but he talks about visiting the house that Melusina had lived in in France when she had lost Frederick the, the little boy who had started this whole hunt. And he also talks about growing up with her, about what it's like to be with his brothers, about what their school is like, and kind of brings that part of her life alive in a way that her own writing hadn't necessarily done. So that is the last piece of evidence that surfaced. But I'm not, at this point, I'm not sure that I can quite say that I'm done with Melusina. I'm trying to make sense of all these different pieces um, to create a kind of hybrid journal and biography. And whereas before I think I was desperately trying to justify why she was interesting, that she made this great move that was ahead of her time, or she was um, different from women of her time, I think now that the most important thing about Melusina is kind of the way that she's touched my own life, that we have her life so beautifully documented in all its different phases. There's a kind of a text that's known as micro-histories, the idea that by studying a single person or a single event very closely, you can learn something about the flavor or the texture of the past. And I think that's what this is. It's partly about her own words and the way that they, they still make me laugh or make me cry, but also the way that her life and her experience is so much something that can place you in the middle of the past in such a remarkable way. And that's what I'm hoping this volume